Okay, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> okay, welcome for you. all those that are streaming. I'm not a technologically inclined person, but my wife is, so I, I'm sure I saw quite a hefty list of going. So um, thank you. Um, let's open up in prayer and let's just ask God to help our hearts hear what we need to hear and guide us in how we're to use this in our lives here on earth. Heavenly Father, we just thank you with just grateful hearts for the opportunity to, to come together and to learn that which you would want us to know. God, you know that trauma entered the world and we've all experienced it, God. Lord, your heart is for healing. Lord, I just ask that we would learn how to be healing vessels to one another, especially our children. Lord, you know some of us didn't have compassionate, loving, caring human beings full of grace in our lives. And sometimes we felt like we were um, unfixable. God, you proved that lie wrong. God, I just ask right now with that spirit in mind that everyone listening both here and out on the web that they would just um, consider a new way of seeing our children i ask this in jesus name amen welcome 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 um well my name is gary Cecina. some you out there know you just all met me um i am a pastor my wife's also a pastor uh, we both were come from uh, sun cow and sometimes people say don't say but that's the truth. But let me just say this. I never felt at home as much as I feel here. That's right, yeah. I, I, I'm so blessed to, um, to be here in this beautiful part of the country. Um, let's see. Psalm 40, it basically was a brainchild back in 1992. I was, I've been a therapist since about 1981 or so. Um, and you know what? I just saw a whole lot of exploitation going on, a lot of craziness going on, and a whole lot of wounded, injured believers um, coming to get help. And sometimes, well, most of the time, God did always provide somebody who he had a hold of their heart to be able to work. And, and that goes without saying. But... I just had this burden. There were a lot of people we couldn't help based on finances and resources. And, and so um, the brainchild was to start a ministry that helps in uh, any life controlling problem and make sure that nobody is ever turned away. So, but like time does, I got locked up in a business world and I taught in um, college and, and um, you know, and I always basically was in the ministry anyway. And there was, I was serving without the title of Psalm 40. So me and my wife come out here and we pray and we said it's time that it's launched officially. And so, yes, we do have a church, but we also really mainstream our bread and butter. Our life call is really to help others in need, help others that are hurting and struggling. And mm -hmm. my wife is an expert. She'll say she's not. <laughs> but um, uh, for someone who, who you know, my, my seminary training is in pastoral counseling. Um, you know, I read a lot of books. And you know what? She's read a lot of books. And um, it brings me to shame. I say, honey, you should have your master's two times over mm -hmm. easily in regards of what you, your heart has driven you to in regards of learning about this issue. So without that in mind, um, once again, those of the outside on the line, if you feel your heart so much, this is uh, free to the community. It's free to you at any time to access those who have um, been invited and are on the web, mm -hmm. right? Am I correct on that? Yeah. Okay, so those out there, um, spread the word about what we're doing here. Um, if your heart's up, keep us in prayer regardless. No matter what, that's primary. But if you got a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, whatever, please drop us a line with that. That would be a blessing to keep us doing this. God's going to do it anyway. We know that. But um, we also want you to be part of that blessing too. Um, so, with that in mind, right. I think I'm going to introduce my lovely wife, Nina. Please come on up. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. <clears throat> All right. Like Gary said, I read lots of books. And, but let me, let me give a little bit of background. Um, for the past 18 years, I've been a special education teacher. 
And so I've spent 18 years working with kids in the classroom, working with kids who have various needs and, and various backgrounds themselves. Um, and then, you know, Gary and I became adoptive parents 11 years ago, um, which was a wonderful, wonderful journey. Um, but at that time when we adopted our son from China, we didn't know anything about trauma or PTSD or what that looks like or what happens to kids. Um, when, we, when that kind of came on our radar, our son was going into fifth grade. And so a lot of years had passed, a lot of struggles had taken place. Um, and when we started to clue in on some of the things that we were seeing, um, my personality is one of those that when I, when I want to know something, I want to know everything about everything. And so I started reading books. And the stack of books that you see over here on the side is most of the books. Um, and that's going to be listed on, on one of our slides if you'd like, you know, just kind of a, a title list. But I started reading and I started digging because, you know, even the things that we were helping our son with, I really felt like we were missing something. And that turned out to be really the missing link. It was what we were missing. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. <laughs> and so the reading list grew. Um, and the, the presentation that I have to share today, most of that was what I put together in order to share with his teachers and his school staff. Because what I'm about to share today is a lot of what I wish I had known as a starting out adoptive parent. It's a lot of what I wish I had known as a classroom teacher. And it's what I wish I had, I, I wish my son's teachers had known so that they could have met his needs better in the classroom. It turned out that his needs were best met not in the classroom, and we chose to homeschool. So he went to public school all the way up through almost the end of sixth grade, and we chose to pull him out in homeschool. As a special ed teacher, I felt that I could meet his needs better than what was happening in the classroom, and that is not a dig on his school system or his teachers because he went to a great public school system and I really liked every teacher he had. They just weren't able to meet the needs and understand his trauma and what that looked like in the classroom. They just weren't equipped. And his learning style was such that he learned better in a one-on-one -on -one environment because just being in a classroom with 30 other people was too overwhelming for him because of his trauma history. So I'm going to invite you to take pictures or screenshots with your phone if there's anything. I've also got some papers and pens over on the side table if you'd like to take notes. But if you see something on the screen that you really want to snap a picture of, you're welcome to. Everything that I have is quoted from the experts. So like Gary said, I don't consider myself an expert because these folks who wrote the books, they did the research. They're the experts. But I have to say, I did walk it, I did live it, I did walk beside my son, beside my husband, in the trenches. And so I'm gonna be sharing a lot of research, but to pair with that, I'm gonna be sharing with you our personal experiences. Um, just by a show of hands, do we have any teachers? Do any of you ladies work in schools? Okay, but teacher, okay, or children's ministry? Good, school staff support moms grandmas foster good <laughs> everybody anybody everybody who loves children, children anybody who works with children or serves children or ministers to children if you're tuning in online um just so you guys know the way facebook does the live is it will show me a tally of how many people tuned in but i don't know who that is so if you guys are watching even if you just hit the like button or something I'll know that you tuned in and I'd like to thank you for just being here. So feel free to leave comments. If you're tuning in live or on the replay and you have a question or a comment, please go ahead and leave that and I will get back to that and answer a question or comment back later on. Or if you just wanna say hello, I'm, I'm here and happy to see you, um, that would be great too because then we know um, who we've been able to reach. 
Um, so our reading list, I'm going to step aside and make sure everybody can see the screen too. Our resources that are listed here is the stack of books that's over on the side. And I have read all of those books. Most of them I've read multiple times. I know that most people, a lot of people, don't have time to read an entire bookshelf multiple times. <laughs> so that's part of my mission and my passion is to put that information together and to be able to share it. Um, <clears throat> when I read a book, I highlight it and I write notes in the margin and then I go back to it. And so a lot of what you're getting today is all my favorite quotes that really hit the core of what we're talking about. Our objective today is to understand what happens to a child's brain chemistry and emotions when they've experienced trauma. And we're also gonna be learning some tips and some ways that we can assist kids in um, when they've experienced those situations. My favorite book you're gonna see highlighted in the middle, they're alphabetical, that's part of my thinking too. It's like, it has to be in order, but I just wanted you to know what my favorite book was. If you're going to invest time or money on one book, I highly suggest The Connected Child by Karen Purvis. That's the one that's on top of the reading pile over there. She is from Texas Christian University, and she has done tons of research and intervention with kids that have experienced trauma. A lot of the kids have been adopted. A lot of the kids adopted internationally. A lot of the kids through foster care. But again, that's not a prerequisite to necessarily having trauma. And what I mean is there's plenty of kids that who have not been adopted or who have been in foster care that also have experienced trauma for different reasons. If you're taking notes, I'll leave that up there for another second. Again, you're welcome to snap a picture with your phone if that's helpful. But all of those books are excellent. Um, Heather Forbes has my other two favorite books. Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control is excellent in understanding kids that struggle with difficult behavior. And Help for Billy, which is the other book by Heather Forbes, is the school partner for the Beyond Consequences book. So one kind of gives more information for families. The Help for Billy book, if it was up to me, every single teacher would read that book. I actually gifted that book to my son's school, um, to the school counselor. All right, can I jump forward? All right, I'll bring that back if anybody wants to take a look at that again at the end. The online resources is a list of websites that also are really helpful. The empoweredtoconnect.org is where you will get all of Karen Purvis's information and videos. If you went to that website and click on resources, you can watch Karen Purvis doing the thing that she does best. And all, she, she works with kids in a way that only Karen Purvis can do. And so I know I'm kind of baiting you to be curious about her. So <laughs> take the bait. And when you've got a few minutes, her video clips are short. Watch a few of her videos. It's great information. <clears throat> Again, Beyond Consequences has a website. Attached Trauma also has resources. ACEs Too High. If you've heard of ACEs, we're going to talk about ACEs. Some people who have learned a little bit about trauma have learned the Adverse Childhood Experience Inventory. So we're going to touch on that in a minute. What lives in the balance.org, Ross Green is an excellent resource. He really brings to light a whole different philosophy when it comes to thinking about kids and difficult behavior. So his name is gonna come up again later. I don't have one of his books on my book stack, but keep note of his name and the website. That might be something that you would be interested in checking out. If you're on Facebook and you wanna connect with a support group that has an actual Facebook page group, um, Parenting with Connection, is the group where everybody has kind of read the Karen Purvis book and we're doing our best as parents and professionals to implement those techniques in our home and with our kids. And you'll get a lot of support from other parents and professionals. 
Um, so if you connect online, that's a great Facebook group. Karen Purvis coins the term children from hard places. And this is kind of a blanket term for any child who has gone through a difficult circumstance. And she kind of, she gives these six risk factors that really are quite global when we think about kids in general and who that we know may have experienced something difficult. And I'll be sharing a little bit more information about our son as we go along because he was adopted internationally from China and we know zero about his birth history, but knowing the situation of how children come to be available for adoption in China, we're able to put some puzzle pieces together. One of the first um, hard places that she talks about and shares research on is a stressful pregnancy. If mom has a very stressful pregnancy, her cortisol levels go up. Long term, having high cortisol levels isn't good for us, but when we're pregnant, it is not good for the developing fetus. Now, our son was most likely a victim of the one child policy. That's, the one child policy in China is not just a rumor. It was true from the 1980s up until about two years ago, they finally stopped it. Families were only allowed to have one baby they had to have a legal permit permission from the government to give birth to their baby. There's a high likelihood that our son was a victim of the one child policy and his mother was not able to keep him and raise him. Now, when I think about her stress level, knowing that she's carrying a baby that she is not going to be able to keep. And you can tell I'm passionate about it because there's times where I am going to tear up because it, it is hard. It's hard to talk about when, when we've walked it. But when I think about his birth mom's stress level and how he personally was probably bathed in cortisol for nine months, before he's even born, he may have experienced uh -huh. trauma. Before he's born, I can already put a check mark on the risk factor for mom probably having a stressful pregnancy. A difficult birth. This could be anything. This happens all the time. Any mom that's high risk, Anytime there's an emergency, anytime, you know, our son, we know, because I have to go just based on what we know, we know that when he got to the orphanage at six weeks old, he weighed six pounds at six wow. weeks old. He may have been a preemie. Mom may, maybe didn't have prenatal care. We don't know. Maybe there was some sort of birth trauma. We don't know. But I would check the box again if I'm, if I'm playing the hypothetical game or having to hypothesize. I would check the box on probably it could have been a difficult birth. Abandonment or neglect. In China, there's no safe surrender. You know, in the United States, moms can take baby to, you know, police station, fire station. That's still considered to that baby, that's still an abandonment. That's still a break in that caregiver. But in China, she had to place him on a stoop at a, at a market where he would be found and taken to the orphanage. And so any, any kind of abandonment, any kind of break in, you know, caregiver, you know, that, that baby doesn't know what the situation is. All they know is, you know, I was held by mom and now I'm not. And so in our situation, I have to check the box again on, on abandonment and neglect in an orphanage full of how many, 500 kids? 500 children in Chongqing City, China, in one orphanage. I don't know how many staff members they had, but I'm certain they didn't, it wasn't a one-to-one -one ratio. No. Okay, the babies, there's no way they got what they needed. So neglect was also part of his history. Trauma, which could be defined as any single event trauma, which we kind of categorize as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or attachment trauma, meaning any break in the attachment of the caregiver, and that's called um, complex trauma. Our son, too, we know obviously, you know, was born to birth mom. 
stayed in an orphanage for two and a half years. Um, after that, he went to a foster home for 18 months, and then we adopted him when he was four years old. So we were his fourth home in four years. Difficult. Any kind of abuse. Early hospitalization. That could be, you know, in the category of birth trauma. That could be a baby that was born with any kind of an illness and has to have recurring medical interventions. That also, <clears throat> that also counts for trauma. And so Karen Purvis defines these six risk factors. And any child who has any of these risk factors, she calls them a child from a hard place. Which I think is a really kind and politically correct way to say it. And when I say politically correct, I don't mean to kind of whitewash it like that. I mean, that's really compassionate. Mm -hmm. Because when we're in the trenches and we're working with kids that are very difficult, with difficult behaviors, we put a lot of names on that that aren't as compassionate. And I'm guilty of that myself as a mom and as a teacher of calling those behaviors certain things. But I think just saying these are children from hard places, I think, is a really compassionate way to look at it. And again, you know, I'm giving you the perspective of an, of an adoptive mom who adopted internationally. But we know in our schools, even in our community, children who have experienced trauma from being internationally adopted aren't the highest statistic of our children from hard places here on the peninsula. You know, kids here have traumatic experiences due to lots of different reasons. And so as you're thinking about those kiddos that you know and the kiddos that you work with, I know you've got them in mind. And I'm sure that they fit into some of these categories also. So who has heard of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences? Is that something that's kind of come across your, across your radar? Some schools and school districts are starting to give some trauma-informed workshops, which is good. A lot of times, ACEs is kind of where they start. The ACEs research was started, and I'm drawing a blank on who started the research. Kaiser, it was Kaiser that started the research on the adverse childhood experiences. But what they were doing, it was designed to link children who have had stressful experiences to the point that it raises their cortisol levels for an extended amount of time. They're measuring medically the outcomes on how that raised cortisol affects these children later in life. And they have documented links to heart disease, cancer, <coughs> diabetes. So when you look at the ACEs research, if you went to one of those websites where you really could read all about the ACEs, you'd see a lot of charts and graphs about how stress affects us later in life, which we all know that's not a good thing. Um, but the ACEs go through 10 questions, and you mark one point for every question that you say yes to. And at the end of the 10 questions, you kind of have an inventory of how much trauma you may have sustained. This is, it's helpful, but it's not the be all end all. And the reason I say that is because if you take somebody like my son with a history of his trauma experiences, the ACE questions don't really target the trauma that he has experienced. And so if I read through the ACE questions, I might not answer as many yeses for my son because they're not really asking the right questions. And so if we just went by the ACE questions, I think sometimes we can miss other kinds of trauma that our kids may have experienced. So I'm just gonna go through, there's 10 questions, so I don't wanna be exhaustive, because this is just a small part of what we're talking about, but I just want for you to um, just see what the ACE inventory looks like. So question number one says, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt. These questions are hard to read 
because we know, you know, whether we may have personally experienced that or we know kids who have. It's, this is a hard, this is the hard stuff to really think about our kiddos that we care about and think about them having these experiences. But if anybody answers yes to that, they score one on the ACE inventory. Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? If yes, score another point. Did an adult or person at least five years or older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you, or have you touched their body in a sexual way or attempt or actually have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? Far too many children answer yes to this. Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or too high to take care of you, or to take you to the doctor if you needed it. Again, too many, too many kids answered yes to this. Were your parents ever separated or divorced? High percentage, of course. Was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her or sometimes, often, or very often, kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes, or threatened with a gun or a knife. It's unfortunately that we have, it's unfortunate that we have to know that the reason they ask these questions is because this happens. Do you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or used street drugs? And Gary, whose expertise is in drug and alcohol counseling, also brought it to my attention that that question probably should also include abusing prescription drugs, that it's not just illegal drugs that could cause a problem in the home or cause a traumatic situation for a child in the home. Was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? Did a household member go to prison? Those are the 10 ACE questions. And again, if, if we were going through that inventory with a child, we would count one point for every time they answered yes. Now we know too that some people go through difficult situations and aren't as affected long-term as other people. And the key to that that the ACE, the ACE inventory also brings to light is resiliency, as resilient as people are. And the second part of the ACE inventory is actually a resiliency inventory and that's another 10 questions that I'm not gonna share at the risk of being exhaustive. But the resiliency inventory, the second part of the ACE inventory has questions relating to feeling loved, feeling safe, knowing there are people who can help and people who are trustworthy, having a sense of control over oneself. So no matter how many aces you have, if you have these pieces in place, that's gonna help you overcome better than the people who don't have these pieces in place. As caregivers and church members and support staff and teachers, as people who love children, we can help. This is how we can help. Karen Purvis would call these qualities felt safety. 
and helping children to have a voice. When they're in situations where they feel they have no voice, they have no choice because their situation is happening to them. Helping them to have a voice, to be able to voice their feelings to someone safe is huge. I liked this quote by Mark Golston. Trauma shatters your most basic assumptions about yourself and your world. Life is good. I'm safe. People are kind. I can trust others. The future is likely to be good. And replaces them with feelings like, the world is dangerous. I can't win. I can't trust other people. And when I think about my son in particular, who came into this world and spent four very difficult years, by the time he came to us, I knew we loved him, but he didn't know. I knew we were safe, but how was he supposed to know that? As soon as he was beginning to feel safe with us, because we adopted him when he was four years old, by the time he started to feel safe, I had to send him to kindergarten. I knew the school was safe. I knew his teacher cared about him, but he had no way to know that. When he walked into a school with every part of his being believing that the world is not safe because he got left on a stoop, the world is not safe because he's lived in four homes. We need to make sure we don't believe that because he doesn't remember it, doesn't mean he's not affected by it. Mm, and I've had people say, caring people who want to offer me a word of encouragement, but they incorrectly had advised me, at least he doesn't remember it. And that, honestly, that makes it even harder to overcome because he doesn't have a conscious memory with language attached to it that we can talk about with a therapist. That trauma got hardwired into his body at a cellular level, and he doesn't know why he's afraid. He doesn't know why he's overwhelmed. And he can't verbalize how he's feeling. All he knows is he's stressed. And that was, a, that was a journey for us. And we later on, I'll, I'll share with you a little bit about the therapist that we worked with and how she, um, how she helped our family. But it took a lot of therapy to figure some stuff out on how to help him overcome some of those traumas. What does trauma look like? Mm -hmm. And this is such a short list. Underlying trauma can look like a lot of different things. And I'm, I'm not gonna name them all. But any one of these things, we might know somebody that struggles with one of these things like an eating disorder, or substance abuse, or depression, or a startle response. My son is 15 and he still will startle if I just walk into the room and say his name and he wasn't expecting me to walk up behind him. He's not consciously afraid, he's not consciously afraid of me, but his, his startle response, oh mom, you scared me. Oh no, honey, I wasn't trying to scare you. I was just coming in to say it's time for dinner. Yeah. And he, he jumped. Because it's, it's just wired. It's wired in him. So some of the things even that we saw with our son at home and at school weren't even on this list. And it took me a long time to figure out that the day he came home with scissor holes cut all over his brand new school uniform t-shirt, why? Why did you do that? He doesn't know why. We'll talk about, we're gonna learn the brain chemistry on why he had no idea why he did that. He was so stressed. One of, one of the experts in one of the books, because I just looked him all over again, so I think it was Heather Forbes, says scared people do scary things. And they don't know why they do them. There was no rational reason for why he put the scissors in his shirt. And he couldn't explain to me why. All I know, as I learned about trauma, was he was so overwhelmed. His stress was causing his body to do things that just did not make sense. And throughout the school years, as I started to tune into that and understand, I started to figure out when he was most stressed at school. 
because we saw very odd, I can only describe them as odd behaviors because they weren't behaviors that actually made rational sense. And when I started to see the odd behaviors, I knew. And then I had to start digging and go, what's going on? Call the teachers, what's going on? So we're gonna talk a little bit about trauma and brain development because trauma will rewire the brain at a neurological level. And there's some things that we can expect to see when we see kids with a history of trauma. This is a quote by Karen Purvis. Each time an infant is held, rocked, fed, and spoken to, brain growth is stimulated. Each time a child watches colorful scenes or listens to sounds, her brain circuitry grows and develops. As a child watches her mother's facial expressions and sees how she interacts with others, she learns to read the meaning behind other people's behavior. This isn't the perfect best case scenario, right? Mom brings baby home, and think of all the things mommies do with babies. We rock them and we sing to them and we read them stories and we're there every time they're hungry. When that doesn't happen, without all of this vital sensory input, a child's brain circuitry becomes impaired. That's why children who were neglected and mistreated early in life so often display, and we saw all of these with our son, delayed learning, social ineptness, attachment difficulties, aversion to touch or textured foods, poor behavior in noisy rooms, and even problems handling changes in schedule or plans. Until I understood this piece, I had no idea why he was struggling. Why was he struggling academically? Why was he struggling with behavior in the classroom? Why was he struggling out at recess? And when I understood that how much he missed out on especially in his first two and a half years in, a crib in, in an orphanage, two and a half years he missed of his brain being wired the way it needed to be wired. He's wired different. And I had to accept that. And as a mom, it's hard. And as a special ed teacher walking beside parents who are understanding their kids' disability, I'm now on the other side of the table. And I had to figure it out the way I was trying to help parents figure it out themselves. And when it came time to sit at the IEP, I was a teacher for 10 years before I brought my son home, writing the IEPs as the special ed teacher. When I had to be the parent at an IEP meeting, I didn't know what to do. And I, I got help from me because I didn't know how to sit on the other side of the table. And I made my husband go with me to every single school meeting, even though I knew the meetings at like the back of my hand. As a teacher, as a parent, it was a whole other story. Prolonged stress alters the brain. This is a quote from the Harvard University Center on the Developing Child. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that prolonged activation of stressed hormones early in childhood can actually reduce the neural connections in these important areas in the brain. Our kids that have experienced trauma and prolonged stress have less neural connections for learning and reasoning. My son struggles with learning, and he struggles with reasoning. And I had to remind myself to be compassionate, because as a mom, it can, it can be frustrating. As a teacher in the classroom, it can be frustrating. When we've got kiddos in children's ministry, it can be frustrating. And I still remind ourselves, Gary and I still look at each other and remind, he reminds me and I remind him. Okay, <laughs> it's okay, we're dealing with some neuro neurological stuff. Behaviors communicate what's inside. It's not a matter of bad versus good behavior. 
And now I'm reminding myself and all the teachers and all the behavioral experts, Gary's a behavioral expert. And we came into this parenting thing going, all right, I'm the special ed teacher and he's the behavior guy and we know how to do this. <laughs> we didn't know how to understand trauma. That was a whole other learning lesson. But even as teachers and parents, we talk about good behavior and bad behavior, or he misbehaved, or he's making bad choices. We need to take the language off the table and just look at the behavior. The behavior is like the sign language or like the thermometer. It's 80 degrees or it's 40 degrees. What's going on in the room? What's the temperature? Is that undesirable behavior? Why? Not jump to a consequence. You know, we were good at timeouts. And in the classroom, I, ha I had all the behavior chart things. <laughs> I, I, I knew how to do behavior charts as a teacher. So as a mom, oh, well, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run my house with my kids just like I run my classroom, because you know, that worked. And so we do the behavior thing. But instead of giving the consequence for the, be for the behavior we don't like, we need to first look at the behavior and go, where's that coming from? If that's an undesirable behavior, this kid is stressed and we need to find out why. Was it something that happened at home even before he got to school? Was it something that happened on the play yard and they just got back from recess? Dig a little deeper what's going on. Figure out a won't versus a can't. And that's easy if we look at a skill. He can't tie his shoe or he won't tie his shoe. If he's never learned to tie his shoe, I would say he can't tie his shoe. Now, if he's tied his shoe 10 times and you know he can, maybe there's some other reason that he's you know, not performing this task that I know he knows how to do. But if you've never seen the child perform a task, we need to look at the can't versus the won't. It's great that teachers, more often than not, will put kids in cooperative groups to do little activities together. You know, maybe they're gonna do a science experiment or they're gonna work on a poster board and learn how to cooperate because these are life skills. When we're adults and when we're at work, we need to know how to cooperate with each other. And so they're starting young. Awesome. Except this is where my kid would fall apart because we forgot as teachers that learning how to cooperate and communicate in small groups is a learned skill that my kid didn't learn yet. And now we've got a behavior problem because he can't communicate and he can't cooperate and he didn't do the work. Is that a won't? Is he being uncooperative and disobedient and belligerent? Or he can't. And so we've got to build up some skills and first identify, is that a can't or a won't? What's wrong with you? versus what happened to you, you know? What's wrong with the kid that came to school that's already not okay? What happened? What happened to him at home? Or what happened to him out on the yard or at lunch? Our son was also a victim of chronic bullying. And even though we knew we were sending him off to a teacher that was a safe environment, and a school that said zero tolerance for bullies, he would get out on that play yard and that was no longer safe. And now we've got a child with a history of trauma going into a situation that they feel very unsafe. Are we surprised when he falls apart? I started to not be surprised anymore. Ross Green, he's the one where I said remember his name even though I don't have his book because I like his philosophy. He reteaches how we think about behavior. He says, kids do well if they can, instead of kids do well if they want to. We have to believe kids all want to succeed. Nobody wants to be a failure. We know that as adults, that's innate to us. We all want to be successful. We all want the gold star. We all want the pat on the back. But sometimes we fall into the trap then of treating the kids like they need more motivation. 
that they have to want to do well, and so we're going to try to reward them. But if they can't, the reward is just going to make them feel bad about themselves when they can't achieve it. Because if we believe that they can do well if they can, if they're not doing well, we have to look at why they're not. And that means they can't. If they're not doing well, it's because they can't. Not because they're being disobedient. Not because they're choosing to just be defiant. Our kids with a history of trauma end up in survival mode more often than not. Interaction between the infant and parent activates and refines many complex regulatory processes, including critical functions such as emotional regulation and distress tolerance. Survival instinct is good. Survival instinct means if I come across that cougar that I think crossed my yard last week, I can fight, I can flight, or I can freeze. That's hardwired. God gave us that survival instinct. However, with prolonged trauma, we can get stuck in survival mode. We can get stuck in fight, flight, freeze, where our stress and adrenaline level stays up, and we act like we're running away from the cougar or fighting the bear in every situation. And there was nothing I could do to tell my son, you're safe at school. That did not override what was happening within him. Early and prolonged trauma impacts the developing child and reorganizes the adaptive systems towards survival. What eventually appears as problems and functioning are in fact the child's resilient solutions to a world he expects to be unpredictable, unreliable, and ultimately dangerous. And what really jumped out at me where it says, um, child's resilient solutions. My son was the student who could never find the pencil, who never had the piece of paper, because if he ended up with the pencil and the paper, he wasn't going to be able to do the work. And so that, you know, if that was not a conscious choice, I don't believe, I'm going to pretend like I can't find my pencil. You know, as a teacher, I know those kids. You're halfway through the lesson and you go, Johnny, your name's not even on your paper. What have you been doing? Ten minutes have gone by and Johnny looks at you with a blank stare. And then I realize that's my kid. That's what's happening to him in the classroom. And his schoolwork was coming home not finished. And then we had all the homework to do. And so part of our process was the damage control and how can we help him because we saw this happening. When a child experiences trauma, the child's ability to develop a sufficient regulatory system is severely compromised. In cases of severe trauma, the child's life is literally at risk. For these children, their internal survival mechanisms then become activated dedicating all the body's resources to remain alert in survival mode. These traumatic experiences are stored and for, the most for most children are buried as unprocessed and unexpressed memories within the body-mind system. One of the books over here by the author Bessel van der Kolk is called The Body Keeps the Score. And all of his research shows exactly this that those traumatic memories are stored in the body at a cellular level, whether or not kids remember it. And they get wired for survival mode. And it's our job, and it's a challenge, to help them overcome and to be able to calm those systems that are telling them, you know, everything is a fight. So our body is wired for fight, flight, freeze. So fight, <laughs> looks like we had a trick with our bullet points, that's okay. In fight mode, these are the things that we might see as parents with kids in our home, as um, teachers. We see oppositional behaviors 
And we wonder, why is this kid being so oppositional? They can be argumentative. They can be stubborn. They can challenge authority. Sometimes they do dangerous or violent things. And like Heather Forbes said, scared people do scary things that can happen when they're in fight survival mode. And we saw all of these in different ways with our son. Sometimes it was more passive aggressive. Sometimes it was more of like this, I call it the huff and puff, where it's like the stomp, roll your eyes, where he wouldn't be verbally oppositional, but his body language would show it. In flight mode, somebody may actually flee or walk away or flee within themselves. My son at one point, I think in, in the upper grades, maybe fourth or fifth grade, he left the classroom and went to the library. Now that's not openly dangerous in and of itself, but the school staff had to look for him. They didn't know where he was, and they found him in the library. Now the first tip off we need to ask ourselves is why did he need to leave? What was going on that he had to leave the classroom to go to a quiet place I think he saw the library as a safe place or a quiet place that he needed to calm himself. Very often, he would be the one that would flee inside himself. You know, at parent-teacher conferences, the teacher would tell me, you know, he'll just take out books out of his desk and just read them. You know, in fourth and fifth grade, he loved that diary of a wimpy kid. So he would stash the book in his desk. And when it was math time, that's the hardest thing, right? He'd pull out the book and read it. And then he'd get in trouble for being defiant for being disobedient, for being not focused, and for not paying attention. When really, he was in such a survival mode, he was checking out. He couldn't handle being in the classroom at that time. Distracted, hyperactive or unfocused. What do we label these kids? Because we label them, and we get the diagnosis, and we give them their meds, we did that too. We medicated our son starting in first grade for ADHD. And by the time he was in sixth grade and we figured out, that's not the diagnosis. This is a symptom of him being so hyper alert. You know, like his body system is searching for the bear, the threat. He was in survival mode. He didn't have ADD or ADHD. That was a symptom. That's what it looked like when this was what we were dealing with. Attention seeking, freeze mode, you know. We have deer that cross our yard all the time. The deer started nibbling on a tree we didn't want it to nibble on the other day, and I knocked on the window and said, hey! And the deer looked up, and he froze. You know, that's instinct. That's freeze. And then he did. Those deer are so really not afraid of us, they don't flight quickly. He, he moseyed away. You know, but the animals are hardwired. You know, the deer, if it was a bear, maybe he would have fought me. The deer isn't going to fight. He did flee, but his first instinct was freeze. So when we see kids do that, and they're sitting there and not, they're not doing anything, sometimes we call them lazy. Sometimes we call them a daydreamer. It might look like they're not trying or that they don't care. Don't you care about finishing your worksheet so that you can go out to recess? Is it a can't or a won't? Oh no. We're going to motivate them by taking away their playtime because they need more motivation, because they won't do the worksheet. Oh no. Guilty as charged, because if you can't do the worksheet, the recess isn't, a motivation isn't going to help if he's lacking the skill to either do the worksheet, or he's so overwhelmed, he's in survival mode and he's completely frozen. Trauma affects cognition. Mm -hmm. And again, we have experience with this because our son does have diagnosed learning disabilities because of his trauma. Problems with executive functioning. This is all of that frontal brain, prefrontal cortex. In a few minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about the parts of our brain. But kids who struggle with planning, 
by the time they get in the upper grades and in middle school, they're completely disorganized. Because, you know, again, walk the walk. Cause and effect. Babies get wired to understand cause and effect when they're in the crib. Because when they cry, when they cry, mommy comes. When I cry, parent comes. I don't want to just say mommy's, daddy's come too. When I cry, somebody comes. When I cry, somebody comes. Cause, my voice does something. I have power. I'm meaningful. It makes something happen and it gets my needs met. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's something that occurred to me. Uh -huh. um, the numbing part. So yeah. cause and effect. Um, Ethan gets hurt. Uh huh. Pain is never attended to. So, mm -hmm. ow, that hurts. No attending to it. So right. eventually, you don't respond to your pain. Right. So you, that's why he didn't respond like a normal kid to any painful that's situation. True. He walked around like a Vietnam vet. Yeah. Just numb. He would fall down. He so would scrape he, his knee. He would, would hit cry. his head. He wouldn't cry. He, would he just, wouldn't cry. He wouldn't yeah. come get me. You mm -hmm. know, think of it. Any typical, you know, little one, they fall down, they cry, somebody runs over and they cry and point to their owie and he didn't do that. We had to teach him to do that and go, oh no, come get mommy. Oh no, you need a kiss, you need a band-aid. I had to tell him to come get me. Even to the point that even when he was a little bit older, he actually struggled um, for a little while with nosebleeds and, you know, just typical stuff. You go to the ENT and they, you know, said nothing was the problem, but I had to tell him in the night, if you get a nosebleed, please come knock on my door and wake me up, and I'll come help you. He had no experience with climbing into bed with mom and dad. He has never slept with us. He never came and climbed into our bed in, in, in the night. I had to teach him, if you're ever sick, or the times you put you know, the little one to bed with a tummy ache, if your tummy hurts in the night, if you think you're gonna throw up, please come and get me. Wake me up, it's okay, knock on my door. We had to teach those behaviors because that what that didn't get wired in him when he was a baby. So when babies in the orphanage or when they're at home with a caregiver that just, you know, is intoxicated or unable for whatever reason, baby cries, nobody comes. Baby cries, nobody comes. Baby cries, nobody comes. Cause and effect does not wire for them. And their voice, they learn, my voice doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. My voice is not powerful. I don't mean, I'm nobody. I'm, you know, I'm not important. And that gets hardwired. And if I had asked my son, even as a little guy, oh, who do, are you loved, are you important? Oh, yeah, 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 he knew how to say yes. He didn't understand what his body had been hardwired to understand. So there was that disconnect between what his body was telling him and we had to teach him all of those things. So when we see kids, by the time they get into, into school even, struggle with cause and effect, it's why the behavior chart stuff doesn't work. That's one, this is one reason we're gonna talk about some more in a minute. But when we try to um, motivate, even with a positive reward, or with a consequence, you didn't finish the paper and you're gonna miss the recess, or you misbehaved, and so you need to, you know, <clears throat> have this consequence. What we desire, the reason we do that is so that they can learn from that experience so that they learn to not do it again. I want you to learn to get your work done so that you can have the reward of going out to play. But if you're not wired for cause and effect, that means nothing. They're not gonna learn from that experience. So my issuing a consequence to try to teach, it's not gonna, it's a moot point. You know, when we use the word discipline, discipline actually comes from the root word of disciple, which means to teach. We kind of tweaked that word and made it mean like to issue consequences or to punish. But to disciple means to teach. Jesus had disciples, and he taught them in a disciplinary way through discipleship, not through a punishing way. And when we start to think about how to connect with our kids that struggle, think about connecting 
and discipling and walking alongside because giving a consequence or even a reward for a behavior we want to see, it just doesn't connect. They're not wired for that to, for that to make sense to them. Language difficulties. Vocabulary deficits. Our son does struggle with functional language communication things. He's, he very often stutters and struggles to explain something like he's at a loss for words. Um, abstract thinking, he's very concrete, black and white. We have to teach idioms and um, abstract kinds of language. Pragmatic language means those social conversational skills. What I say and how I say it, and my body language, you know, what my body language is saying. So our, our son struggles with that a lot, and we've done speech and language therapy with him. That wasn't just, you know, typically we think of speech therapy as, you know, pronouncing S's and not having a lisp. I mean, he worked on that too, but a lot of his speech and language therapy was social communication. How to have a conversation with your friend and ask appropriate questions and, and that kind of thing as he got older. Failure to develop self-efficacy of what I do matters. Again, that kind of comes back to that learning cause and effect. If I cry and mom comes, I have an effect. I matter. If I cry and nobody comes, I've learned that I don't matter. Object constancy. Out of sight, out of mind. For four and a half years, our son never owned things of his own. In an orphanage, you don't own your own clothes. You don't own your own toys. He did have a foster home for 18 months until he was four. Maybe he had some things that he played with. I'm not sure if they were allocated to him specifically or if they were shared among the other foster kids. He's still at 15. If something goes up into his bedroom and gets put away, he forgets it's there. If I put away the holiday candy, just so that, you know, Halloween or, I just found Easter candy in the cupboard because we stuck it in the cupboard and he forgot about it. Out of sight, out of mind. And that still is part of that wired trauma stuff. And I don't know if he'll grow out of that. Or will it just be, you know, something that he learns to deal with for himself? Processing disorders and learning disabilities. Those are the things, those are some of the reasons why we homeschool. You know, even getting support services through the school system wasn't quite enough to meet his needs. And so we do homeschool and we work a lot on filling in the gaps and the, and the individual things that he struggles with according to his learning disabilities. Okay, <laughs> I've given you lots of brain stuff and all about trauma and what happens to our kiddos when they have difficult experiences. Are we ready to learn what to do? <laughs> okay, how adults can help because we love kids and we want to be a support and a resource for them. Staying regulated ourselves. This is at the top of the list, because this is probably the hardest one. As a mom and as a teacher, keeping the cool while we help kids in their struggle is hard. It's hard to not get upset and, you know, let our behavior spiral along with theirs. Recognizing the triggers, and that means their triggers as well as our triggers. One of the books that Dan Siegel wrote is called Parenting from the Inside Out. And it's as parents, how do we look at our history and why we parent the way we do and understanding our triggers because there's some stuff that my son does that I can be long suffering and have all the patience. And then there's some stuff where my fuse is fast. And so I look at that and I know what those things are. Where it's like, okay, it's that, it's that thing. It's that thing that sets me off. Okay, stay regulated myself. <laughs> what am I going to do? And we're going to talk about essential oils too in, in a few minutes because that's one of the things that really helps me. Keep the stress down, help.
help calm my emotional stuff in my brain. Um, but also recognizing the kids' triggers. And as I learned my son and his trauma triggers, I realized that if he feels abandoned or rejected, if he feels there's been an injustice done, you know, so-and-so argued at school out on the play yard and, you know, whatever happened, X, Y, Z, and that's not fair. If it ended up with that's not fair, he's hardwired for I got left on a stoop in China and that's not fair. What happened to him was very not fair. He's very much, he, he talks about going into law enforcement. Because I think justice is big for him. Life should be fair. And we've had long conversations with him, individually and when we've worked with a therapist, to help him understand what happened to you wasn't fair. And that's, that, that is what it is, that's not okay. It is what it is. And we're gonna learn from that and we're gonna overcome that. So I started to see when things would happen at school if it played into his rejection, I wanted to play with those kids and they wouldn't play with me. Bam, rejection, of this kid was abandoned. I had to explain to his teachers and his school staff, there was one day at school, we were late picking him up from school. And we don't usually run late, we're on a pretty good schedule, but one time, you know, things happen at home, some excitement happened in the afternoon, it was something good. But he was at school a little bit longer than he was supposed to and he started to get very nervous. And at the school, it's no big deal, they're safe. The secretary knew they were safe. The kids all go out and play in the yard until mom picks them up and it's supervised and they're safe. My kid didn't know he was safe. He went into the school office and asked, can I call my mom? No, 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 you're fine, go out and play. It's okay, your mom will be here. You know, if she's not here by, you know, like 3.30, like they let the kids play for a half an hour. You know, God forbid that much time goes by when it's, you know, the teachers are leaving. They'll let the kids call home. She didn't let him call home. She told him to go back out and play. He walked home. Fortunately, he, he was in fifth grade. He was old enough to have walked three blocks, but he was told, the school secretary, after I had a conversation with her, did tell me I told him not to leave the campus because the, we know schools, they're responsible. They can't have kids leaving the campus without permission. He walks home, oh my gosh, what are you doing home? We were gonna come pick you up and the whole thing. And I had to call the school secretary. She explained the whole thing to me. And I said, but what you don't know, my child was a bit, you know, cause she's saying, no, he, he knows you're gonna come pick up. No, he doesn't know I was gonna come pick him up. My kid got left on a street in China when he was six months old, six weeks old. Everything in his tiny little body said, I've been left. And he didn't know that I was coming. Because when he's not in his rational mind, and we're gonna talk for a minute, in a minute we're gonna talk about flipping your lid and what that means. When your thinking brain disconnects from what you're feeling, he could not rationalize, I'm 11 years old, this family has loved me for many, many years, they are safe, they keep their word, my mom will come, maybe she's stuck in traffic, maybe something happened, the school is safe, I can just go play and hang out. His thinking brain could not think. All he knew was, I'm six weeks old and I got left. Once I explained that to the school staff, they kind of felt bad, but they needed to know. And I believe I even told them to make a note in his file where the school staff needs to know if my son ever needs to call me. You need to let him, because this is different. This is a different situation. Teaching regulation. Our kids that haven't been hardwired to know how to calm down and regulate their emotions, we can teach that. We can do that together. Late, I think one of our later bullet points is co-regulation, which means we're gonna do that together. We can do an activity together. We can go on a walk together. Those things, we know as adults, those things that help us calm down. Oh, let's do some deep breathing. When we do our Tai Chi class on Saturday mornings, 
We do breathing exercises because they're so relaxing and calming and centering. We can teach kids how to do that. As adults, we know sometimes just going for a walk outside and getting some fresh air is all we need. We can teach kids to do that. Set limits with empathy. There's times we need to say no. And I have to remind myself that my no, instead of being accompanied with, because I said so, <laughs> needs to be accompanied with, I'm sorry, I know you're really disappointed, but we can't do that right now. That's, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir right here, because <laughs> I know, I gotta remind myself sometimes. Co-regulation, that means we're gonna regulate together. We're gonna go out and do something together. Instead of just telling somebody, you need to calm down. There's a funny quote, you know, going around, you know, people make little Facebook quotes on it that says, nowhere in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down. <laughs> Co let's calm down together. And that's another one. I'm going to receive that for myself, too. Because when I get all worked up, I want to tell him, go do, go, go do some, you know, go use some essential oils or go, you go outside and walk around. Wah, wah, wah. I probably need to go with him and go walk around. I need to go with him. Whatever I'm telling him to do, I need to go do it too. Unconditional acceptance. And this is one of those Jesus lessons. Unconditional. There's no judging. The behavior, when we separate the behavior from the child, it's like separating the sin from the sinner. You know, we can hate the sin and love the sinner. And we need to remember to do that with our kiddos and let them know that we love them anyway. You might have had a total meltdown, buddy, but I love you. So together, let's go clean it up. Some tips on what to do about school. Maltreated kids need to have a safe, anchoring relationship with their teacher. This connection can counteract the awfulness of previous experiences with adults and teach the behind the scenes skills missed during the first years of development. You know, as a teacher, you know, we get the whole classroom ready and we've got the rules and we've got the charts and we're ready to just let the kids know what's expected and what their rewards are going to be. We're always hoping we don't have to give the consequences, but you know, we're ready. And that student comes in and they don't know they're safe. And we don't know the kind of a home that they just came from. We don't know anything, but ready, we're ready to start imposing the rules because that's what good teachers do. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking as, you know, as one of the teachers, but before we start, imposing the rules before we start the correcting we need to start connecting because it really does stem from the relationship especially for the kids who might not be or whose situation is continuing to perpetuate a difficult situation you know for my son that difficulty ended when he was four and he came to a loving home, okay? And we're, we're kind of filling in the gaps and doing the damage control. But a lot of our kiddos that we see in church or that we're seeing in school, they're still in that difficult environment. All the more reason that us as adults and teachers and caregivers and, and you know, children's ministry staff, that we need to be that safe person and we need to be that person that will connect with them, we might be their only safe place because we don't know what's happening at home or what they're going home to. Relationship drives academic achievement because it's that connecting relationship that's gonna help them calm and feel safe so that now they can learn. If they're in survival mode, if they're stuck in flight, fright, freeze, they're not learning. Their brain is not in a position to take in information.
a few do's and don'ts, and this is for all of us, caregivers, teachers, everybody. Do remain present and calm with time ins. A time in is very much different than a time out. And I was joking with Gary the other day, I said, I don't know when time outs kind of became so mainstream with parenting. I was born in the 70s and kind of grew up in the 80s and my parents didn't do time outs. We got grounded, but the whole time out thing wasn't on the forefront of parenting yet. I think that kind of came in the 90s and it's kind of still here. But really the time out is, I'm rejecting you because you haven't shown acceptable behavior. So I'm rejecting you to go over here until you innately figure out how to learn this skill that I'm not teaching you right now. And when you've learned that skill all by yourself, you can come back. That sounds harsh, I know. I just called out timeouts because that's what we're doing when we do the timeout. And for the child who's been rejected, for the child who needs to learn that co-regulation skill, the timeout isn't gonna help. A time in says, I see you're having a difficult time with whatever is expected. Come over here by me and let's do that together. Or come over here by me, even though I can't be one-on-one -on -one with you right now, you're gonna come very close to me because I'm mommy and I'm washing the dishes or I'm cooking dinner. But you come sit right by me and you know you can look at a book or whatever, but it's that close proximity. I'm not rejecting you. You come over here by me and read a book while I wash the dishes and when I see that you're kind of, you know, you've kind of calmed down a little bit, we'll talk about things. Maybe we'll have a redo. You know, maybe we need to go clean up the mess that happened when, you know, things got overwhelming. Um, but a time in is the opposite of that rejecting. Make the world smaller. Sometimes things can be really overwhelming. You know, our son came home at four years old and we were so excited we wanted to shower him with toys and games and put everything in his bedroom was so pretty and colorful. It was too much. We started taking things out and giving him just a couple of books to read and a couple of toys to play with. It was too overwhelming. For kids on the play yard, especially our son and a lot of kids, the play yard is way too overwhelming. What can we do? And this is a challenge, I know, because I've been on a lot of school campuses. What can we do to make that world smaller? Smaller groups of kids, partnering up, peers. It's a challenge. And I know, because I know what teachers are challenged with. Offer sensory items or movement. Sometimes kids are wiggling in the chair because their body needs to move. Let them move. Hey, everybody stand up and we're going to do 10 jumping jacks. Or hey, everybody stand up and we're going to march around the room while we say the multiplication facts or whatever. Movement. Just letting them move. Sometimes, you know, let's go for a walk. Or even in a school. You know, sometimes the teacher can't just send the kid out for a walk. Maybe there's a staff member. Maybe there's a support staff that can go with them. And just take a movement break. You just need to move. We do too, right? If you're sitting here and we've been sitting for a while, if you need to move because you've been sitting too long, by all means, get up and stretch it out and maybe just move around a little bit. Say little when dysregulated. Ouch, that's me. I need to say less, because when I'm dysregulated, that's when I say things I don't mean. Mm -hmm. And when the kids are dysregulated, they can't hear what we're saying. If I'm giving them a lecture, you know, the you're in trouble lecture, and here's 5,000 reasons why, <laughs> and my son is dysregulated, Gary will just look at me and go like, he's not hearing you right now, you might as well just stop. Yep, you're right. <laughs> we kind of, you know, we have the look where it's like, you know, he's not, he's not hearing you right now. Oh yeah, all right. Talk it over when calm. This is good for relationships in general. Wait till things have calmed down, mm -hmm. then we'll have the conversation. Teaching skills with do-overs. You know, even simple little things. You know, a child might snatch something that they want. You know, either from an adult or from another child. They snatch it away. I wanted it. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. 
Now, as a parent and as a teacher who's done the behavior stuff for a lot of years, my first instinct is, that's bad behavior. You go to timeout, or you're losing a privilege, because that's not acceptable, that was disrespectful. Did that teach the skill that was missing? No. And I've issued you know, a timeout or a rejection of that child based on an, a behavior that they struggled with. That didn't teach them to not snatch something the next time they want something. So we're gonna, okay, oh no, no, no. We can't take things out of you know, our friend's hand. Let's try that again. Let's redo. Okay, we're, we're gonna redo, so we're gonna give it back. What do you need to say? May I have the toy, please? Okay, and then we get the toy and we say thank you. You've wired that child for a new skill. We've made a new neural connection. So now that that child has learned the skill, they get to do it again and again and again, and then that becomes a habit. If all we do is scold them for a behavior, we haven't created a new neural pathway or taught a skill. So redos are really important when our kids struggle, even when they have the total meltdown. And we go, you know, we're gonna calm down, we're gonna regulate, okay, together, we're gonna co-regulate, we're gonna go clean up the mess, okay, now what could we have done? And the whole meltdown, depending on where it came from, could have been, I wanted the cookie before dinner or something simple where now we can go back and do the redo and can I have the cookie oh you know what I want to say yes yes you can have the cookie as soon as you eat your dinner so you know what that did I'm that having child, some trouble with the connection <laughs> that's okay that's okay that child didn't have that reaction to hearing no they got their yes good they're happy we just need to wait a little longer. And so we've had that redo. Use natural consequences with empathy. And the natural consequences is the key. Because the unnatural consequences, like, you know, the behavior loses a privilege. That's that cause and effect again. That cause and effect does not make sense to them. They're not wired to understand a not natural consequence. You know, you didn't clean up your toys so you don't get dessert. And in our world, that makes perfect sense to me. But to the child who didn't understand cause and effect, that is so arbitrary. That's just like two random things happening. But a natural consequence. I am so sorry your toy is broken. Now, that, that toy could have gotten broken in the meltdown. Maybe they threw the toy because they were so mad and it broke but it's a natural consequence. Your toy is broke. You can't play with it now, or you need to play with it broken. I'm so sorry your toy is broken. They, they connect the dots on that. They drop the toy, the toy broke. Now they've learned a cause and effect, that's good. Maybe a new little neural pathway for learning a skill. But the natural consequence, am I gonna fight, fight, fight because you're not gonna wear your jacket outside when it's cold? I could, because that mom in me wants to protect my little one, and I don't want you to be cold, and okay, well, natural consequence. Okay, you're gonna argue about wearing your jacket, but natural consequence. Okay, go ahead. What's gonna happen? The little one gets cold, they learn, the, they learn their own lesson. Oh no, if it's cold, I'm gonna take my jacket. So they learn that consequence. And encourage repair just like a redo, or encourage the repair if they had a break in a relationship due to a behavior. We might need to go together and go apologize to so-and-so. Or we might need to tape, you know, Big Sister's homework back together because, you know, maybe we had a meltdown and ripped all the papers and now everybody's upset. We've all calmed down, but the paper's still ripped. Let's do that together. So we've taught a repair. Sister, I'm sorry. I'll, eh, four-year-old might not do a very good job at taping the paper, that's not the point. The point is we're teaching how to repair when we have a break in a, in a relationship. Don't. And I am guilty of every single one of these, so please don't feel like I'm calling you out because I'm calling myself out too. Reject, like a timeout. You need to go away from me because I can't handle you and your behavior right now. 
threaten or lecture. <laughs> Been there, done that. Isolate, again, like a timeout, unless, there's an unless to this. If a child has, is in a situation where their meltdown or their dysregulation is causing anyone to be unsafe, if they're unsafe themselves and they might harm themselves, or if there's other children present in a classroom or in a ministry room where the other children are safe, we might need to either come along and remove the child who's having a hard time, or we might need to remove the other children. I've been with groups of children before where it's okay class, we're all going to go, and somebody is going to stay and help Johnny who's having a hard time, and we'll all come back when the situation is diffused. So in that case, and then you would always want to have an adult, you know, stay safe with the child. Sometimes kids know, or you know the kid, he'll be okay if he gets some time to himself. I know some kids that struggle where it's like, I don't want you in my face right now having you help me calm down. Give me a minute. Okay. You know, you go have your minute, and I'll be over here. Let me know. Let me know when you're ready. Sometimes we as adults need that, like, hey. I need to chill for a minute. I'm going to go sit in the car. Or I'm going to go for a walk. You know, the same thing we as adults need, kids need sometimes too. Raise our voice and yell. I know. It just happens, but it's so not helpful. Shaming. Punishing by piling on consequences. And it just happens. We get so upset. You're going to lose this privilege. Oh, and now, we're, now you're never going outside to play ever again as long as you live. Because that's we get so dysregulated ourselves. And then it turns into this whole, this whole thing. Using angry and nonverbal language. Again, for our kids that struggle with that pragmatic language or body language, that they, they don't even understand. If I roll my eyes, they're not even understanding that I'm upset. And using sarcasm, which sometimes it comes out. But for our kids that are so literal, that don't understand abstract language, they're not going to understand our sarcasm as maybe a hint to go do something. You know, if I say to my son, the trash is full, thanks for taking the trash out. He did not hear, I need for you to do a chore and take the trash out right now. Of course, that's what I meant. He didn't hear, it's time for you to take the trash out. And he could be completely willing. My son loves to help. If I say, please take the trash out right now before everything spills out on the floor. Okay, mom, and he'll do it. He might do the huff and puff, but he'll still do it. But if I give that sarcasm, or even if I drop the hint, trash is awfully full. To him, I'm just stating a fact. I am not asking him to do anything. So in our home, that's what we, <laughs> that's some of the stuff that we struggle with that we've had to compensate for as being very direct and literal when we need for him to do something. Do reduce fear. And again, it's that fear, not that all situations we deem scary. Like I said, I knew my son's classroom was safe. I knew the teacher was nice, but it was that overwhelm that was fearful for him. Reducing fear, and you can even kind of replace that with overwhelm. Reducing overwhelm can even minimize behaviors such as agitation and constant movement. Think of those kids that are just like, you know, the moving, the fidgeters similar to those seen in attention deficit disorders. We have encountered many harmed children who are not truly hyperactive. Instead, they are hypervigilant. This occurs when children were so traumatized by abusive and unpredictable caretakers or situations during their earlier lives that their primitive brain remains locked in a state of high alert, keeping them perpetually on guard. The fight or flight stress hormones continue to rage throughout their bodies and set those youngsters in motion, making them fidget endlessly, unable to sit still and focus on any single activity because they're constantly scanning their surroundings for danger. And they don't realize they're doing it. If I said to my son, or I can even think of children that I've had in my classroom, 
you know, what are you scanning for danger? What are you afraid of? They'd be like, well, what are you talking about? It's that subconscious. It was wired in their bodies. I even think of a little boy that I really had concerns about. I really had concerns that I thought he had an attention issue and I was trying to prepare myself to talk to mom. I think I need to have that conversation with mom that I think she might need to look into this until I learned more and then I learned what this little guy's home life was. And the mom, there were about, there were about 18 people living in the home. Mom had struggled um, being a gang member and everybody in the home was named uncle something. And this little guy was just the sweetest little guy but fidgeted and was just all over the place. And I went, okay. This isn't, this isn't an attention issue that needs to be medicated. This is this little guy's hard wiring because of his home life. He's the children from hard places that I'm reading about in my books. But how can we reduce the fear and overwhelm for our kiddos? And coming back, coming back to this quote where we un I underlined on purpose, unpredictable caretakers. In an orphanage, everything's unpredictable. In some kids' home lives, everything's unpredictable. So it's that unpredictable nature that just kind of sets everything in this, you know, anything can happen. Imagine going to work where anything could happen. Anything. Your boss could give you anything to do and you have no idea what could happen. Your coworkers could behave at you anyway, and you have no idea, are they gonna be nice, are they gonna be mean? Is my boss gonna pile on a ton of work that I can't do? Are they going to? Imagine going out into the world having no clue what to expect. I can't, I can't even quite imagine that. Because in my world, everything's so predictable. Because I know, I know what the world is like, and I know that the world is safe. For a child who's never learned that the world is safe, for a child who's learned the opposite, anything can happen. So walking into a classroom, or going to a new foster home, or going to the after school club, or coming to church, anything can happen. Anything unpredictable will bring out the fear response. Fear equals, I don't know you and I don't know what to expect. My son is 15 and he's been with us 11 years. He still thrives when he knows what to expect. He'll still get up in the morning and have breakfast and say, mom, what are you doing today? Not what am I doing today? Not what are we doing today? What are you doing today? Because if you're going somewhere, I still need to know where you're at and where you're going and where you're gonna be back. Because there's still that six week old baby inside me that got left and didn't know where mom went. I still never go anywhere without telling him where I, he, and he, he, granted, he does like to tag along with me. He loves, if I'm grocery shopping, he comes. If I'm doing anything, he comes. But you know, I still need my own time. I still need to go do grown up mom things. So when, I, when he's not coming with me, I never go anywhere without telling him pretty much where I'm going and when I'm expected to be back. I'll be back in a couple hours. If I'm gonna be late, I'll text you guys and you'll know if I'm stuck in traffic or whatever. He never has to think, where's my mom? Or I don't know where she is. If we're, we have a big house, we have a big piece of property here. If he doesn't know where I'm at, he'll come hunt me down. I didn't know where you were. And some, he, he can take a joke now. He's okay if I say, ha ha ha, did you think I was abducted by aliens? And he'll joke and we'll have a laugh about it. And I'll go, no, you know, I would have told you if I was going somewhere. But I know there's still that trigger of, oh my gosh, where's my mom? And I've seen other kids struggle with that, where mom, you know, mom went out, we, you know, we were with some friends, and mom went out to do mom stuff with her friends, and child came in, and her first question was, where's mom? Because she didn't know where mom went. And dad told her where mom was, and then the situation she was struggling with that required mom's attention, unfortunately, spiraled into her getting more upset and 
you know, once she was able to talk to mom and get in touch and they were able to repair the situation. But, you know, I, I saw my son in that situation with that first question of where's mom, that's, that's fearful for him. When we homeschool, we have, and a lot of people are very open and flexible when they homeschool and, you know, anything can happen and that's what they like about homeschooling. But we do set up what I call a flexible structure where we start at pretty much the same time every day after breakfast and we make an agenda and we write down things that we're gonna do and he likes checking things off on the list because then he knows when he's done. And there's a predictability in that that's comfortable for him. Because if we just walked through the day and he had no idea what to expect or what activities we were gonna do or when on earth are we gonna be done doing schoolwork, he just, he would be too disoriented and disorganized to focus and get stuff done. Providing an atmosphere of felt safety disarms the primitive brain and reduces fear. It's a critical first step towards helping your child heal and grow. Building trust will give the message, a safe adult will take care of me and protect me. My needs matter to this adult. trust. Show emotional warmth and affection consistently. Just being present, just being, being there for a child. Offer positive emotional responses and praise often. Again, these are just ways to show that we care. But more importantly, if they're not receiving that at home, you might be the only person that's showing a positive response or praising them for something. Praising them for who they are. You're awesome. I'm so glad you're here. Respond attentively and kindly to your child's words and actions. Again, part of that is just being intentional. Mom, come and look at this. Okay, you know, I need to do that more often. Let me go instead of like, oh, hang on, or oh, I'm busy. Interact playfully. Give advance notice of upcoming change. Again, that comes back to that predictability that gives comfort. My son is okay being flexible when things change, as long as he knows what to expect first, and then if I tell him, oh, we had a change of plans, we're not doing that this afternoon, so-and-so got sick and they're not coming over. Oh, okay, but it still helps to know what to expect in the beginning. The child will receive the message, this adult understands what I feel. I am safe here. I am of value to this person. Mm. Trauma and behavior. So some of the difficult behaviors happen. All negative behavior arises from an unconscious fear-based state of stress, as opposed to any clear cognitive or conscious place. When we're working with our kids that have the trauma, that negative behavior isn't on purpose. Trauma impairs the ability to think clearly during stressful events. Dan Siegel, who's the author of a book called The Whole Brain Child, he calls it flipping your lid. And in a minute, on the next slide, I'm going to show you what that means because it, it helps it make total sense. Behavior modification doesn't address the child's underlying stress. So again, when we do the behavior chart, when we're doing those rewards and consequences, the kids who can't perform the task, it, you know, giving the consequence or trying to motivate with the positive reward when they can't do the task, it's not addressing why not. We have to trust that fundamentally at their core, children are acting out due to stress, fear, and a lack of regulatory ability. It comes back to that can't versus won't. Billy 
Charlie's response system is so overly stressed, it does not allow him to think clearly during difficult social moments. So think about the little one on the play yard or in the group of kids that just isn't getting along. He reacts without thinking. His behaviors fall outside of what is socially acceptable. He gets into trouble for acting inappropriately. He feels bad and stupid and is unable to learn due to the heightened level of stress in his system. So in the classroom, we see this stuff happen out on the play yard and it's that same chain of events. Now they come back into class and it's time to do work. And physically, he is unable to learn. He is not gonna learn that math lesson that takes place after the altercation on the play yard. He's physically incapable. Flipping your lid. Okay, everybody get your, get your fist ready. This is your brain. This is our brain. And we're gonna tuck our thumb in the middle and wrap your fingers over. And when we're doing martial arts, we never, ever, ever make a fist this way. Because mm -hmm. if we punch, we would break our thumb. So this is not a punching fist. This is a model of your brain fist, okay? So in the middle of your brain, this little part of your thumb is your limbic system. Also, we can call it the amygdala. But this little, the thumb is where all of your feelings are. This is your happy, sad, scared, mad. Every feeling stays right here. Our fingers, when we wrap that over, our brain, that's called your prefrontal cortex. We also can call it the thinking brain. This is where all of the thinking, all of the cognitive stuff goes on. When our thinking brain stays wrapped around our feelings, we can control our feelings because we can think about them. And we can think, oh gosh, I'm not going to say that. That would be mean. Or, oh gosh, I'm not going to hit that person, even though I'm really mad because that would be rude or I might get in trouble. Our thinking brain controls, helps to control what's going on emotionally when our brain is connected. When we get upset or triggered or we go into that survival, fight, flight, freeze, Dan Siegel calls it flip your lid. Now you're going to lift your fingers up. We flipped our lid. And literally when we say sometimes when we get angry, I flipped my lid or I flipped my top. Literally, I'm getting a cramp in my hand. Literally, <laughs> our thinking brain is no longer connected to what's going on with our feelings. What were you thinking when you did that? This was not connected. I wasn't thinking anything. Why did you do that? I have no idea. My thinking brain was not engaged when I did that, said that, cut, cut my shirt with the scissors. All of the odd things that we saw, and there, there, there is an infinite list of things that we can see kids do when they flip their lid. And so at this point, we're no longer thinking, we're no longer rationalizing, we're no longer hearing. This is why we say, you know, stop, stop lecturing, stop talking, they can't hear you. The only thing we can do at this point is to help re-regulate or co-regulate together. Let's get this back down where your brain, your thinking brain, can get back in control. Why the behavior modification doesn't work. So we've touched on that a few times. The point systems, the rewards, the behavior contracts, the level systems, are also triggers to shame and fear. So in addition to the fact that the whole cause and effect thing doesn't make sense, and if we recognize the fact that the child doesn't need more motivation, if it's a can't versus a won't, and we're trying to motivate that child to do something that they can't do, when it turns out that they really can't do it, how are they gonna feel? like a loser, like I can't do anything right. My son would buy in every time the teachers tried to get him on one of these. And all of the teachers use them in the classrooms all the time, I did too. But then sometimes the kids with the difficult behaviors got this special behavior plan. And my son would buy in, yeah. And he would come home, Mr. So-and-so said that if I do blah, 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 I'm gonna get this prize and I'm, I'm gonna try real hard. 
finally I figured out I need to call Mr. So-and-so and go look. Let me, let me explain to you how this works because after we see that, you know, Ethan figured out, he never really did get the reward because it wasn't a won't, it was a can't. You could offer me a million dollars to take a calculus class that is taught in Greek. I am highly motivated. I really want that million dollars. That will go a long way here for helping our ministry. And I am so motivated. I am going to get my Greek book and I am going to get my calculus book and I am going to sit in that class and I am going to try so hard. But I don't speak Greek and calculus is like way over my head. Okay? Am I really going to get that million dollars? I'm not. And I'm going to feel pretty bad about myself because I'm going to have to come home and tell my ministry partner and my husband, gosh, I could have had a million dollars for Psalm 40. And I didn't, I couldn't get it. I didn't get it. But you know what else is going to happen as I'm sitting in that class where I don't understand a gosh darn thing? I'm going to pretend like I can't find my pencil. <laughs> then I'm going to pretend that I don't have a paper. And when some kind soul takes pity on me and gives me the pencil and the paper and says, just here, write your name on it. What am I going to do next? I'm going to start counting the ceiling tiles. Now, do I have an attention problem? Not really. Do I have a motivation problem? Do I need two million dollars? No. And if I'm really, really bored, I actually might start stabbing the person next to me with my pencil. <laughs> have we seen kids do that? I have seen so many kids, right? It's not a lack of motivation. Giving them more incentives if they can't perform the task isn't going to help. It's not about Billy making a better choice or choosing to do something different. Excitatory neurotransmitters and hormones are fueling these negative behavioral responses. The solution is to not ignite more of these by, imp by implementing a consequence, which will not only be perceived as more of a threat by Billy, the solution lies in calming the brain in order to move back to a state of calm and safety at the body level. Kids do well if they can, not kids do well if they want to. My son really, really wanted to. He was just too overwhelmed to calm everything that needed to be calmed down. Some other tools. So we've talked about a lot of ways that we can just come alongside kids and help them. Sometimes we need to call in some other professionals and I'm going to talk about a few different kinds of therapy because when our family got to the point where we knew we needed some outside help, this was what we did. There's a form of therapy called EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. It's very high level neurological stuff and even the experts can't really explain how it works. They just know that it does. Some professionals do it by actually having the client move their eyes in different ways while they do different activities or talk about different topics. You can also do it with what's called bilateral stimulation. Our therapist had these little buzzer um, handheld devices that would vibrate and buzz alternately while we did, while we talked together as a family, while she helped my son process different parts of his traumatic situation. For trauma that's stuck at that cellular level, this helps reorganize the brain and put that trauma back where it belongs. Art therapy is what she combined with the EMDR. So he would hold on to the little bilateral buzzing devices, or he would put them in his pockets, and they would kind of like the you know like a vibrator you know like on your on your phone device, while he did an art activity that involved you know 
know his trauma or being loved by his family or all of those things. And it was very multimodal that really helped him understand his trauma, integrate his experiences, and help that survival mode, fight, flight, freeze, um, diminish. There's a type of therapy called theraplay, which is an actual um, like copyrighted term. Theraplay sessions create an active emotional connection between the child and parent or caregiver, resulting in a changed view of the self as worthy and lovable and of relationships as positive and rewarding. EFT, which stands for Emotional Freedom Technique. Some people for short just call it tapping. And there's, um, it involves tapping near the end points of energy meridians located around the body in order to reduce tension. And so there's sequences, there's people that know how to do this and you can even look at YouTube videos where they teach different tapping points on how to tap at different points on your body and it helps your body neurologically calm down. I haven't learned it well enough to be able to use it and teach it yet. It's a tool I'd like to put in my toolbox, but it can be calming. Again, it could be something that if you were gonna, you know, co-regulate with a child, you could say, okay, let's, you know, let's do this tapping together and that would help them calm down. It helps them go from here back to here. Essential oils can help calm the brain. And so I was hinting that we're gonna talk a little bit about essential oils. And this essential oils and aromatherapy has become a passion of mine because we've been using it so much in our home and it's been a really great tool for physical wellness and emotional wellness. And the reason why is because our brain is wired this way. So when you look at the brain, you see the nice pretty flower, you know, the guy is gonna, we're gonna smell it. And the aroma is gonna go up into your nose, into your nasal cavity. And look, here's your limbic system, that's this. Your nose is wired right to your limbic system. When you smell that calming scent, and there's certain plants and certain essential oils that, will, that are very calming, some help us stay awake and help us get alert, some help us calm down. If we use one of those calming oils and we inhale that, that's gonna go right to your limbic system where we're having all of our big overwhelming feelings even before it passes our, our thinking brain. And that's interesting with our sense of smell because all of our other senses go to the thinking brain first before our feelings. If I see something, if I touch something, if I smell something, if I taste something, I think about it first and then I can have a feeling about it. Our sense of smell goes right to our feelings first, which, which is good because if we're here, if we're completely dysregulated and we flipped our lid, me telling you something, talk, 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 isn't going to help. Maybe, you know, looking at all those, all those other senses, if they're coming here, they're not gonna get down here quick enough. But smelling something that would be calming can help calm this so that that thinking brain can re-engage. Now I do have some, some asterisks, some points to note when we're using essential oils. First of all, if we're working with other people's kids, we might not be at liberty to give them essential oils to smell. And I know that. I've heard stories of teachers give, putting oils on kids and kids going home and parents having aversions to what was put on the child. We can, as teachers, we need to be careful. We can't do that. Some schools and some settings, you might be welcome to use like an essential oil diffuser, but some not. Some schools have policies of, you know, we don't do that in the classroom, and I totally understand that too. What we can do, and we can definitely use things in our home, so when it's me with my family and my child, we do a lot of essential oils at home. But if you're in a setting where you're with other people's children, you can use oils on yourself. Again, we need to stay regulated ourselves, so I can regulate myself. If I know I'm getting worked up, I know I can smell something calming, and that's just gonna help me 
co-regulate with that child. Whether or not they inhale anything, I can do that for myself. The other thing too is if I, if I use an oil on myself, maybe I'll kind of be like my own personal diffuser. And when I come alongside that child, that aroma might be calming to them without me having to put it on them or you know, do something that I'm not qualified or have permission to do, if that makes sense. Um, my other caveat with essential oils is make sure if you want to use oils or if you're using oils, make certain of the quality. There's a lot of things being sold in stores that are a lot of different grades of essential oil. And without knowing how the oils are distilled, we don't know what we're inhaling. A lot of inexpensive oils are inexpensive because they are distilled with chemicals or synthetics to draw out more of the oil. If you distill with a chemical, you can get way more oil and keep that oil cost point down than if you're distilling without a chemical. When you do that, you're introducing that chemical to the oil and if you take that in your hands or in your diffuser and you inhale nice and big, those oils do cross the blood-brain barrier. That's what's good about them. That's what helps us, you know, helps us calm down. But you wanna make sure you're not inhaling a chemical that was used to distill the oil. So you wanna make sure that your oils are pure, therapeutic <coughs> grade. You need to make sure of where they're coming from and how they're distilled because you don't wanna be inhaling something and taking that into your brain if it's not pure from the plant. Okay, and I do, I teach aromatherapy classes and we do, you know, we learn different things about how to use essential oils and all of that. I do have a brand that I recommend and that I love. Um, this isn't the kind of class where I want to, you know, do all of that. We have different classes for that. But I always give that word of caution, make sure that your oils are the highest quality if we're gonna be inhaling those right into our limbic system. Breathing can help calm the brain and slow the heart rate. So in Tai Chi, we do deep breathing exercises with different movements. We move our bodies in different ways with our inhale and exhale that's calming. Diaphragmatic breathing can shift us from flight, fright, freeze to rest and digest. That's that calm state where the rest of our body systems can come back into use. You know, because when, when we go into survival mode, every, our digestion, everything stops. We need to calm back down so our other body systems can, can be used again. Um, and this comes from a study from Psychology Today, and it gave a lot of, it was a study of neur neur neurology and all these neurological things that happen in the brain with the breathing and the heart rate. So I'm giving you a super simplified um, version of the scientific study. So when you inhale four seconds and exhale eight seconds, it gives you this calming that actually can lower your heart rate. One study showed the participants who performed this type of breathing for 30 minutes before a test um, reported lower levels of stress and performed better on the exam. Because they, you know, part of it was I think they were calm enough that they could think clearly, but also the more we intake oxygen, that also helps our brain, you know, our brain function. The test concluded that the breathing pattern improved decision making. So now think about that with our kiddos who struggle. Buddy, I see you need a minute. I see you're really struggling here. Why don't we go together and let's do some breathing? Calm all of that down. Now they're gonna be able to think better, maybe make a decision better if they're struggling with maybe an interaction with a friend or a, or a situation. Imagine combining deep breathing with aromatherapy. And that's like, that's my favorite thing to do. And we do that in Tai Chi too, where it's, you know, we might put on, or we might um, use an oil that's really good for calming. Or we might, you know, try on an oil that's just good for respiratory support. 
And so we use some essential oils and then we do our breathing exercises. Our last slide, and thank you for hanging in there with me. I know we're at the two hour mark. Our points to remember. Children who have experienced early and chronic maltreatment need to be understood as survivors. And that's one of those things we need to remind ourselves when it's really easy to get really frustrated with a child who's struggling. When your child appears physically perfect, it's easy to erroneously assume that his or her behavior is willful and intentional. Put aside your preconceived expectations about your child's behavior relative to his or her age. At-risk adopted children may catch up emotionally, behavioral, and developmentally. They're still healing from old wounds that are invisible to our eyes. And even still, our son was adopted at four years old. At four years old, in a lot of ways, he had zero skill in some areas. He's had 11 years of learning those skills. And in some skills, those gaps have closed. And he's you know, functioning at, at a 15-year-old level. In some ways, he's not. And in some ways, he is more like an 11-year-old than a 15-year-old. And we have to remind ourselves there's still that four-year gap that we're, you know, we're hoping that that's going to close and we're working on skills. But there still was that delay in, in some of his development. Understanding the effects of maltreatment helps us avoid the false assumption that a child is simply unmotivated or not interested in being successful. So I hope that our lecture today really just brought to light um, just some new ideas and you know some compassion for the kids. I'm I'm seeing your faces and I appreciate you know I can tell how much you love kiddos and and you just want to be able to support them and be there for them. And so if you've tuned in online, thank you so so much. If you could just let us know that you tuned in by hitting the like or just saying hello in the comments. Again, if this, um, if our ministry has blessed you and you would like to help us continue our mission, you're welcome to share a donation with us or just hold our ministry in prayer. Our next lecture, we have decided we were going to take a poll, but I really felt it on my heart to do a part two for working with kids with trauma histories and give you more tools that's gonna be more like a hands-on how-to for whatever kind of work that you're doing with children. So for parents and teachers and caregivers, if you are in ministry, children's ministry, or if you've got kids that come into your circle of influence and you might find that helpful, we've got flyers for our July, um, our July workshop and we'll be doing a part two to give you more tools in the toolbox. And if you would like to invite, um, whether that's in, you know school staff or pastors or other children's ministry workers or anybody that you know that would benefit from this information, by all means, you're welcome to spread the word. So we're going to go ahead and say thank you to our live stream. Gary, if you want to go ahead and just hit the stop button, I'm going to see if I can save that before we hit share. Is hit there a stop button on it? Finish button. Yep, just hit finish and I'm going to come.